Hi, in this topic we're going to be talking about 1.3, the structure of membranes. And the things that you need to know here are that phospholipids form bilayers in water because of the phospholipid molecules and the fact that they're amphipathic. Uh, the diversity of membrane proteins is due to their structure, their function, and the position in the membrane, and that cholesterol is found in animal cell membranes. So some of the things that you need to know how to do in this particular module would be to draw the membrane model or the model of the phospholipid, um, be able to draw the fluid mosaic model, I should say, versus the membrane model, and then look at evidence that both supported and refuted the davson dinelli model, which was one of the first model, membrane models that was created. So phospholipids are amphipathic molecules, and what that means is that they have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions on them and on the same molecule, and that's what allows them to kind of behave the way they do and, and uh, form the membranes that they do. And uh, it also enables them to form bilayers, which uh, is the way that, as you'll see as we go through this, the way that the two um, molecules line up. So these are the hydrophobic phobic tails, and this is the hydrophilic head of a phospholipid. And you can see here that along this red region right there, that would be where the hydrophilic heads would line up. And then the hydrophobic tails would line up on the uh, interior, kind of facing one another um, in such a way that allows them to um, form this bilayer, as you can see right here. So membrane proteins have a variety of functions, and these things are embedded within the membrane. And some of them are integral or transmembrane proteins, and they span the entire membrane. Some of them are channel types of proteins where they transport ions or substances back and forth across them, either actively or passively. Um, some of them um, are involved or have enzymatic function where they catalyze the reactions of certain substances uh, that are inside the cells. Others act as um, signaling molecules where they, they act as a receptor for like a hormone and then trigger a cascade of events that turns genes on within the cell. Um, some of them are involved in cell-to-cell -cell recognition, um, cell joining as you can see, or just attachment to um, other things, um, you know, other cells, other tissues and organs and organ systems and things like that. And then the peripheral proteins are just found on the either the interior side or the exterior side of the membrane. They do not span the membrane like the integral or transmembrane proteins do. So cholesterol is a, uh, an important part of the animal cell membrane. And what it does is it decreases the fluidity of the membrane and provides a little bit of rigidity to it uh, and, and helps to prevent these water-soluble molecules from easily passing back and forth across it. And it's only found in, in animal cells. Um, it's not found in any plant cell. And the other important feature of cholesterol is that it uh, forms the precursor to many hormones. And one of the important things just to know is not necessarily how to draw this molecule, but just recognize this structure here that I'm kind of circling around with the mouse. This, uh, this is a very common structure. Anything that has this uh, ring structure in it would be some sort of a steroid um, derived from cholesterol. So now some of the evidence that supports the davson dinelli model. So what the davson dinelli model originally said was that the, uh, the bilayer consisted of this lipid component right here, where the, the lipids are aligned and then kind of sandwiched in between uh, um, these two layers of proteins here. So the, the layers of protein almost act like the uh, sandwich bread, and then these lipids would be very similar to like... Um, whatever you're having for your sandwich, whether it's lunch meat or something like that. And um, what the evidence was originally based upon was the uh, experimentally observed surface tension between the protein molecules and the, uh, the layers of phospholipids. And what it did was it explained this barrier that occurred between the interior and the exterior. And it, you know, it stood the test of time for a long time. And it was also based on um, some... Uh, I guess a misinterpretation, you'd say, of some uh, electron microscopy. And if you look here at this, this is kind of like a trilaminar uh, uh, structure that you'd see. And what was originally thought was this, uh, we now know is the membrane, and this is the membrane on the adjacent cell. Well, what was originally thought was this was the protein layer, and this was the protein layer, and then here we have a layer of, of phospholipids in between that. And then as the scientists got better at um, using the electron microscope and really interpreting it and understanding what, what it meant, uh, it, they soon found out this, this was actually um, 
the, the lipid bilayer of one of the cells, and this is actually the lipid bilayer of the adjacent cell, and then what we have in between here is the intracellular space, which is, you know, where you'd have the interstitial fluid or something like that. So as they get better, you know, as often cases with the science, as, as you get better at something, you um, start to perfect the techniques and oftentimes have different interpretations of things that you uh, once thought was right. So um, as they started to interpret these things better and new techniques arose, um, they were able to look in a little bit more detail at the, uh, the membrane structure and they found that some membranes of some uh, organisms and organelles and so forth have different thicknesses like the, uh, the mitochondrial membrane is about uh, six, five to six uh, nanometers thick, whereas the typical plasma membrane is about uh, eight uh, nanometers thick. So that difference right there showed that there was a difference between the two membranes. And not all membranes were alike. Some of them looked differently. And uh, many of these membranes had different concentrations of the proteins associated with them based on what type of cell they were in, what their job was. And that contributed to the different solubilities. So not all cells had the same solubilities either. And then as the electron microscope became more powerful and, uh, you know, they, they perfected its use, as I said earlier, um, they uh, revealed a lot more about the other functions of the, the cells, how they looked, um, you know, and, and how these molecules were uh, associated with them. And then in addition to that, they also developed a lot of new techniques, um, such as you see here the freeze fracturing. And what they're able to do is treat these cells in um, very cold media, like liquid helium or liquid nitrogen, something like that, where they freeze them. And then they etch them with some sort of a, a very sharp knife or diamond blade or something like that. And what this with uh, what they were able to reveal kind of with this structure is just the way these cells kind of broke apart um, revealed a lot about them. And you can see that the uh, proteins were kind of spanning the membrane somewhere on the periphery. If you looked at the two different layers, both the uh, interior and the exterior sides, if they were both covered with proteins like they originally had thought, then they should look very similar. Whereas, in fact, when you look at this, this is the extracellular layer here, and it looks much different than this intracellular layer. And these little uh, bumps and dots here are, are all the proteins. So you can see again up here and down here, there's a difference between um, these surfaces and then this on the inside. So this freeze, freeze etching or freeze fracturing technique really revealed a lot about the, the cell membrane and how it looked and things like that. So as this started to happen, all of this data started to accumulate. And by the mid-1960s, many scientists really didn't think that the Davson-Dinelli model was a, an accurate representation of the, um, the cell membrane anymore. So there was a lot of people working on this and Singer and Nicholson are two people that are very important for you to know. Um, and they came up with what was known as, or what is currently known as the fluid mosaic model. And basically what this says is that the uh, membrane is a fluid mosaic of a bunch of different substances from the, the phospholipids that comprise them. There's proteins, there's carbohydrates, there's cholesterol. Um, there's all this stuff kind of making up this membrane as you can kind of see here. And it's much different than um, the davson dinelli model that was originally proposed. And just like with many things in science, they uh, often change, often build as new technologies become available and new, new uh, experimental techniques and uh, uh, new methods for just kind of analyzing the data that you have. So when we look at the fluid mosaic, there's, there's some things that we want to be able to draw in a drawing if we were asked to do so and based on our knowledge of what it was. So if we're going to draw a phospholipid, um, the best thing to do is to just kind of have a little circle here that would be the hydrophilic head. And then these two tails, these would be the hydrophobic tails. So this would be the head region. And we can say um, that it's hydrophilic or water loving. And it's going to face either the exterior side of the cell or the actual interior side of the cell. And then these here, these are the um, hydrophobic Tails. So if we're going to draw um, one of these um, fluid mosaic models, we can begin by just drawing a series of these phospholipids that we've just drew here. And then you can see here on this side, you've got some more of them. 
And then what I'm going to do here is sneak in like a peripheral protein here. This is on the periphery, okay? It can be there either on the inside or it can be on the outside. So we can call this the um, exterior. Oops, sorry. Spelling here doesn't look very good. So here we'll sneak back in, put our peripheral protein in here. So we'll just call this the exterior. And we'll call this the interior. Okay, of the cell. So now what we'll have here is this is our peripheral. protein and then what we can do is we can draw some more of these phospholipids here and then we can take and we'll just draw this time we'll just draw a globular protein and so this is a trans membrane protein and then if we look here we got to draw a few more of our phospholipids then we might have as we learned earlier these uh, proteins are often very different and in this particular case what we can draw is a channel protein here and we can get back and talk about the amphipathic nature of these things so um, this these uh, proteins here are amphipathic in much the same way that these phospholipids are and what you've got is in this region right here you've got some proteins that are able to be uh, interacting with these hydrophobic regions of the interior yet they have uh, other portions of them on this side that are interacting with the cytoplasm as they move things either in or out of the cell just depending on what's going on here and these things are going to be um, hydrophilic or water loving so they're going to interact with the hydrophilic portions of the the protein here and then some of the other things that we can kind of put into our drawing we got to put some more of these phospholipids down but when these phospholipids become associated with carbohydrates um, Sometimes we refer to these things, if this would be like a, a carbohydrate, branched carbohydrate or something, um, this would be a glycolipid, glyco meaning sugar, and then lipid meaning the, the fat, so this would be a glycolipid. And then we could perhaps, if we can draw a few more of these phospholipids here, we could have another peripheral protein Okay, and then we can have another one over here. So again, we said they could be on the, either the exterior side or on the exterior side. But if we have some carbohydrates associated with these, then this would be glyco, again. Glyco meaning sugar. And then uh, protein, because this is a sugar associated with a protein. And so we can draw some more of our phospholipids here. Maybe put another alpha helix of our protein down here. So this would be another um, sort of a, a, a transmembrane protein. Okay, we can just put that there. So this is representing both of these types of things. And then, um, you know, maybe if we want to draw a few more of the glycolipids, and then if you're asked to uh, make cholesterol or you want to make cholesterol part of your drawing, um, you wouldn't have to really worry about the actual structure of it per se, but you could draw it. Um, just kind of put it in there and then label it. <clears throat> we'll draw our thing up here. We're running out of room. Um, call it cholesterol there. So we have our glycoproteins. We have these uh, um, these things, of course, you can just have um, carbohydrates in there, as it says there. You know, if you were to look at this in three dimensions, you might have um, uh, some carbohydrate.
and we've got our glycolipids, we've got our glycoproteins, um, we've got the uh, integral or the transmembrane proteins, we've got these peripheral proteins here, and then of course our phospholipids with our hydrophobic and our hydrophilic tails. So hopefully you can uh, kind of replicate something like this. I'm sure doing it on pen and paper, it's a little bit easier than with this tablet I'm using. But uh, um, those are the types of things that you should be able to include in your drawing. I hope this helps and good luck.